Audio Jungle. From the studios of KLP Entertainment, this is SMN Sports. Yeah. NFL Week 4, Biggest Questions, Takeaways for Every Game Week 4 of the 2024 NFL season started Thursday night with the Dallas Cowboys defeating the New York Giants. On Sunday, Atlanta Falcons kicker Young Hoku nailed a 58-yard game-winning field goal to down the New Orleans Saints. The Indianapolis Colts handed the Pittsburgh Steelers their first loss, and quarterback Baker Mayfield and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers pummeled the Philadelphia Eagles 33-16. Later, the Washington Commanders blew out the Arizona Cardinals, and the Kansas City Chiefs won a close one against the Los Angeles Chargers. On Sunday night football, the Baltimore Ravens had a dominant win over the Buffalo Bills. On Monday night, the Tennessee Titans managed to win their first game of the season over the struggling Miami Dolphins. And the Detroit Lions handed the undefeated Seattle Seahawks their first loss. Our NFL Nation reporters reacted to all the action, answering lingering questions coming out of each game and detailing everything else you need to know for every team. Let's get to it. Has Jared Goff found his groove? It sure looks like it. After throwing four interceptions in the first three games, Goff went turnover free in week four against Seattle. He finished with 292 passing yards while completing a perfect 18-4-18 of his attempts to help the Lions improve to 3-1. He also displayed his versatility, throwing for two touchdowns and scoring his first career touchdown on a reception from a pass by receiver Amonare St. Brown in the third quarter. He joined Gary Danielson, 1984, as the only Lions QBs to have a passing and a receiving touchdown in the same game. Most surprising performance, offensive line. Lions Pro Bowl center Frank Ragnow was ruled out because of a partially torn pectoral muscle, but the offensive line stepped up with veteran lineman Graham Glasgow shifting to center and Kyoto Wasika starting at left guard. Their protection helped Lions running backs Jomer Gibbs and David Montgomery combine for three rushing TDs in the first half. Eye-popping stats, Monday was a great night for Detroit duos. Goff and St. Brown became the fifth duo to each have a pass and receiving TD in the same game in NFL history thanks to a trick play in the third quarter. It also marked the sixth game in which Gibbs and Montgomery have each scored a rushing TD, tying them for the most such games by a Lions duo in franchise history, per ESPN research. Can the Seahawks get healthy on defense soon? It shouldn't have been a surprise Goff and the Lions had their way with Seattle's defense given all the firepower it was missing, especially up front. The Seahawks had little chance to stop Detroit with Yuchen and Wosu, Boy Mafe, Leonard Williams, Byron Murphy too and Jerome Baker all sidelined. That challenging injury situation became even worse when Julian Love went down in the first half. Coach Mike McDonald didn't sound concerned that Mafe, Wosu, Williams or Murphy would be out long, though Murphy might need at least another week. Early prediction for next week, a whole lot of Kenneth Walker 3. The Seahawks' RB1 returned after sitting out two games because of an oblique injury, and his three-touchdown performance reminded everyone of what Seattle was missing in his absence. Zach Charbonnet filled in admirably, but he's a power back who doesn't have the burst through the line or extra gear through the second level that Walker showed while racking up 80 yards on 12 carries. He would have gotten the ball more if not for Seattle having to throw it a ton while chasing a big deficit. Eye-popping stat. Seattle gave up a career-high nine pressures to Aiden Hutchinson. On those plays, Smith went two of six for 17 yards, zero touchdowns, one interception, and a sack. Fill-in right tackle Stone Forsyth had his hands full, and he'll have to continue to hold down the fort. George Fant must sit out at least two more games on injured reserve, and Abe Lucas was expected to need even more time to return from the physically unable to perform list. What's the deal with Will Levis? Levis threw his sixth interception, tying him with Colts quarterback Anthony Richardson for the league lead. It was also Levis' ninth turnover a league high. To make matters worse, Levis suffered a right shoulder injury when he dove for a first down in the first quarter. Mason Rudolph came on in place of Levis. Titans coach Brian Callahan said at halftime Levis would play if he could go, but Rudolph directed the Titans to a season-high 31 points and their first win. 
Callahan has been committed to leave us after an 0 3 start, but if he isn't healthy, they'll have to add third quarterback soon. Describe the game in two words Smash Mouth Football. Callahan decided to go old school, Smash Mouth Football, and run the ball, but in an exotic way. The Titans' rushing attack featured various motions and formations that confused the Dolphins and produced 142 rushing yards for Tennessee more than double its previous high. Running backs Tyge Spears and Tony Pollard rushed for their only touchdowns on the night. Eye-popping stat, Nick Folk, at age 39, became the oldest player in NFL history to make three field goals of 50 or more yards in a game. How much worse can this get without Tua Tagovailoa? Rinse and repeat after last week the Dolphins' offense was abysmal against a Titans defense that held it under 100 total yards until late in the fourth quarter. Tyler Huntley passed for only 96 yards in his first start for Miami, as an exasperated home crowd watched in agony. With games against the Patriots and Colts sandwiched around a week six by, the Dolphins can still turn around this slide. Coach Mike McDaniel promised changes moving forward, and they are much needed. Most surprising performance, he can't throw himself the ball, but Dolphins wide receiver Tyreek Hill turned in a third straight disappointing performance with 23 receiving yards on four catches. Hill once joked he could put up numbers with anybody at quarterback, but he has only 87 combined receiving yards over his past three games. Biggest hole in the game plan, not getting Huntley more involved as a runner. Huntley finished with a team-high 40 rushing yards on eight attempts, most of which came on the team's lone touchdown drive. When asked about his increased willingness to run on that drive, Huntley said he and the team felt the sense of urgency, trailing by three scores. The Dolphins could benefit from taking advantage of his legs if he continues to start moving forward. How big of a statement did the Ravens make in dominating the undefeated Bills? It took four weeks, but the Ravens looked like Super Bowl contenders for a complete game. From the first play Derrick Henry's 87-yard TD run to Kyle Van Noy's strip sack in the third quarter, Baltimore looked like the team that entered Sunday night undefeated. What makes the Ravens more dangerous than previous years is they're more than Lamar Jackson on offense. Henry ran for 199 yards, scoring two touchdowns. Heading into their first AFC North game next Sunday at Cincinnati the Ravens appear set to make their move in the division, closing to within one game of the Steelers for first place in the AFC North. Most surprising performance, the Baltimore pass defense. After allowing the most yards through the air in the first three games, 291.7 per game, the Ravens insisted their confidence was high and proved it in slowing down Josh Allen, who was the favorite for NFL Most Valuable Player. Baltimore limited Allen to 180 yards passing and no touchdowns, hitting him eight times. Outside linebacker Van Noy, who recorded two sacks for the third straight game, delivered the biggest defensive play. After Buffalo closed to 21-10 in the third quarter, Van Noy had a strip sack of Allen, which led to Baltimore's fourth touchdown of the night. Eye-popping stat, on the first play, Henry ran untouched for an 87-yard touchdown. It was the longest run in the Ravens' 29-year history. Showing his speed at 30, Henry reached 21.29 miles per hour, which is tied for the fourth-fastest speed by a ball carrier this season, according to NFL Next Gen Stats. Henry has reached a speed of 20 miles per hour or faster 27 times since 2018 which trails only Tyreek Hill, who has surpassed 20 miles per hour 73 times. Was this performance a fluke, or will these issues become bigger problems? It was a disastrous night for the Buffalo Bills, with almost nothing going right in all three phases. The loss ended a 43-game streak without losing by 10 or more points, the longest active streak in the NFL and sixth longest in the Super Bowl era. When the second half began with things moving in the Bills' direction, that quickly turned when wide receiver Curtis Samuel took a direct snap, passed it back to Allen, who then fumbled. Baltimore picked at the backups in the Bills' defense, while the offense struggled to get in sync and inconsistencies at wide receiver were noticeable. These are problems that need to be addressed, but the Bills are better than what they showed Sunday night. Most surprising performance, the Bills' offense. After putting up 30-plus points in the first three games, this was a relative no-show. The Bills' streak of 41 straight regular season games of scoring more than 10 points ended, the longest active streak in the NFL. The offense went 2-11 on third down and Allen completed 16 of 29 passes, 55.2%, down from his 75% average to start the season. 
The offensive line had a tough night with Allen pressured on 44.1% of throws and sacked three times after two sacks on the season. Biggest hole in the game plan, not having an answer for the Ravens' rushing attack. From the very first play, when Henry ran for that 87-yard touchdown, the defense had no answers for Baltimore on the ground. The Ravens averaged 8.8 .8 yards per carry and Henry finished the game with 199 yards. While the Bills have backups in at linebacker and nickel corner, the plan in place and adjustments for Baltimore attacking those areas did not work. With Devontae Adams and Max Crosby nursing injuries, how far can this faceless team with a different mentality carry the Raiders? Aside from Adams and Crosby, the Raiders were also without four other starters in T.E. Michael Mayer, R.T. Thayer Munford Jr., L.B. Divine Deblow and S. Marcus Epps. Plus, C.B. Jack Jones set the first two defensive possessions. It was truly a team-first mentality that should only get better when the missing talent returns. Describe the game in two words, good morning. If last week was a wake-up call for the Raiders in getting thumped by the lowly Panthers in the home opener, the manner in which Las Vegas answered the alarm against the Browns was a much-needed morning stretch. Las Vegas came back from down 10-0, and it can take that momentum on the road in Denver next week. Most surprising performance, the Raiders entered the game with the worst rushing attack in the NFL, averaging 2.8 yards per carry while rushing for 153 total yards through three games. Against the Browns, Las Vegas had 95 rushing yards in the first half and finished with 152 yards and two TDs. How can the Browns' defense regain its elite 2023 form? Cleveland's offense has failed to take off, but the defense is more concerning after being one of the best in the NFL last season. The unit couldn't assert its dominance against an offense missing Devontae Adams and allowed more than 150 rushing yards. The Browns brought back the majority of their 2023 contributors, but the traits that made the unit elite sticky man coverage and a propensity for takeaways have failed to carry over. Describe the game in two words, another failure. After failing to take care of a struggling Giants team, the Browns couldn't finish the deal against a team without Adams and Max Crosby. There were continuous mistakes, from a drop leading to an interception to a missed extra point which prevented Cleveland from being able to attempt a tying field goal late in the fourth. Eye-popping stat, with three offensive line starters sidelined by injury and another center Ethan Posick suffering an injury mid-game, the Browns gave up 16 quarterback pressures. Cleveland has allowed double-digit pressures in all four games. How will the Chiefs cover for the loss of W.R. Rassi Rice? The problem for the Chiefs is not just Rice, who suffered a game-ending knee injury in the first quarter. They're also without two other big offensive threats, Hollywood Brown and Isaiah Pacheco. So, it's going to take several players to make up for the lost production. The contributions against the Chargers of Travis Kelsey, 89 receiving yards, Kareem Hunt, 69 yards rushing, and Xavier Worthy, 54-yard TD, are encouraging starts. Most surprising performance after sitting out the first couple of drives, Hunt became the featured back. He played more than Carson Steele or Samage Perrine and led the Chiefs in rushing. Steele's first quarter fumble mostly eliminated him from the playing rotation, and it will be interesting to see how Hunt's contributions increase next week against the Saints. Early prediction for next week, now that the Chiefs need Kelsey as much as ever, look for the Saints to try to eliminate him as a consistent threat. The Chiefs without Rice have no other steady receiver. Worthy is a rookie and a big play threat, but he's not going to be a high-volume pass catcher at this point of his career. Should the Chargers be concerned with their offense? Quarterback Justin Herbert was hobbled with a right high ankle sprain and the Chargers were missing their top two tackles, but their issues seemed more extensive. Wide receivers struggled to separate, and it appeared Herbert and his receivers were not on the same page at times. Herbert and receiver Ladd McConkie connected for a seven-yard touchdown in the first quarter, but it was mostly downhill from there. Most surprising performance, the defense holding the Chiefs to 17 points. Missing safety Derwin James Jr. and outside linebacker Joey Boza, the Chargers' defense had one of its best outings of the season. In the first half alone, it sacked quarterback Patrick Mahomes three times and cornerback Christian Fulton intercepted him. The Chargers were one of the league's worst defenses last season but the game on Sunday was proof that defensive coordinator Jesse Minter is making a difference. Eye-popping stat, Herbert was hit at the time of throw on four pass attempts Sunday, the most in a game in the past two seasons. 
This is likely the result of the Chargers missing their starting tackles, along with Herbert having limited mobility. The 49ers got a much-needed win but at what cost? The story of San Francisco's first four games has been injuries. By and large, those ailments haven't been of the season-ending variety, save for defensive tackle Javon Hargrave's torn triceps, but many of their best players have been at less than 100%. That continued Sunday when linebacker Fred Warner departed at halftime with an ankle injury and tight end George Kittle dealt with a rib issue. Kittle returned but Warner did not. Just when the 49ers get key players back, others depart. That trend is only going to make life more difficult as San Francisco enters a pivotal stretch of divisional games. Most surprising performance, DT Kevin Givens. After placing Hargrave on injured reserve this week, the Niners needed somebody on the interior to help fill that massive void. They turned to a combination of Jordan Elliott and Gibbons, which showed positive returns even if it was against a putrid Patriots offensive line. Gibbons was particularly effective rushing the passer with 2.5 sacks. Biggest hole in the game plan, special teams continue to be a significant problem. Over the past three weeks, the 49ers have had four special teams miscues that led directly to 20 points for their opponents. While it didn't turn out to matter much Sunday, kick returner Isaac Garendo's fumbled kick return gave New England its first touchdown of the day. Given all the injuries the 49ers have been dealing with, the margin for error against better opponents is too small for this to continue. Will the Patriots' sputtering offense lead to a change at QB with Drake May? Through the first three games, veteran Jacoby Brissett had avoided the catastrophic mistake, but that wasn't the case Sunday. A 45-yard pick-six by linebacker Fred Warner put the Patriots in a 13-0 hole early in the second quarter. Brissett had time to throw and an open target, but Warner made a top-notch play. The Patriots' offense is limited in what it can do based on its less-than-explosive personnel and needs Brissett to play mistake-free. Brissett didn't have much help Sunday which is likely part of coach Jared Mayo's thinking in when to turn to May. As much upside as May provides, Mayo doesn't want to put the number three pick in a no-win situation. Troubling trend, RB Ramondra Stevenson's ball security. The Patriots' top running back has fumbled in each of the first four games. The shaky ball security didn't hurt the Patriots in the first two games of the season because they recovered them. But they've stung the past two with both recovered by opponents and turned into field goals. For a Patriots offense that is limited in its firepower, such self-inflicted wounds are unsustainable. Biggest hole in the game plan, the inability to set the edge on defense. After two weeks of talking about this as a top area to address, the Patriots lost the edge three times on the 49ers' opening drive. Keon White was responsible for two of them, and then a combo rush with White and Dietrich Wise Jr. led to the third. Then after the Patriots cut into the 49ers' lead to close to 20-10 early in the third quarter, Joshua Uche rushed up the field to vacate his edge on an easy Jordan Mason TD run. Is it too early to call them NFC East contenders? No. It's still early, of course, but they're playing as well as any team in the division and with a lot of confidence. Washington has an explosive offense as it's only punted once and scored 101 points its past three games. Jaden Daniels is a dual-threat quarterback who has yet to look like a rookie. And the run game is solid. The defense played its best game in containing Arizona's offense on Sunday as well. Describe the game in two words, terrific execution. Washington's run game excelled thanks to play design and execution. The commanders ran from a variety of formations, causing confusion and opening holes. Brian Robinson Jr. rushed for 101 yards in backup Jeremy McNichols, filling in for Austin Ekeler, concussion, rushed for 68 yards and two touchdowns. The Commanders scored on three of four red zone possessions. Most surprising performance, Washington's defense entered Sunday ranked 29th in both scoring and yards. It allowed Arizona to score with an easy 55-yard drive on the first possession, but the Commanders controlled the Cardinals after that. They sacked quarterback Kyler Murray four times and held Arizona to two of nine on third down conversions. Where do the Cardinals go from here? Back to the drawing board. The Cardinals need to figure things out quickly if they want to salvage the season. Arizona has shown what its offense and defense are capable of, 
but the loss on Sunday was emblematic of the team's inconsistencies. Issues abounded on both sides of the ball. After falling to 1-3, the Cardinals will embark on a daunting October schedule with three road games in four weeks. They need to fix an offense that looked stagnant at times and a defense that struggled to contain either the pass or run. Describe the game in two words, big letdown. After taking a 7-0 lead on the first drive of the game, the Cardinals were outscored 27-0, which extended to 35-7. The Cardinals punted on three straight possessions after scoring two of which were three inouts. Those were followed by a turnover on downs and then a punt on Arizona's first drive of the third quarter. Biggest hole in the game plan, following the trend this season, W.R. Marvin Harrison Jr. went dark after the first quarter. After finishing the quarter with three catches on four targets for 21 yards and a touchdown, he didn't have another catch until the third quarter a stretch of 28 minutes and 25 seconds of game time. How concerned should the Broncos be with their offense? On a rainy day, rookie quarterback Bo Nix struggled for the third time through four weeks. He was 7 of 15 passing for minus 7 yards at halftime and didn't have a completion longer than 2 yards until his first throw of the second half, 23 yards to Cortland Sutton. The Broncos didn't convert a third down until there were just over 7 minutes left in the third quarter. They committed to the run slightly more in the second half, and that mixed with the defense was enough. The Broncos are struggling to get the rookie settled in, but it's not all on him. Most surprising performance, LB Justin Strenad. The casual fan may have raised an eyebrow at how often Strenad made a play Sunday, which was his first time taking defensive snaps since his rookie season in 2021. He had a sack on the defense's first snap and was repeatedly in the right spot. The special team stalwart will get plenty of work at inside linebacker in the weeks ahead because of injuries. Biggest hole in the game plan, if the Broncos are going to lean on Knicks, they need more from the team's wideouts beyond the quick game. The wideouts had no catches for positive yardage in the first half. When Knicks has time to survey, receivers haven't consistently created enough separation. And when they have, Knicks has not delivered. Beyond Sutton, and occasionally Josh Reynolds, the Broncos aren't forcing opposing defenses to make decisions in coverage, which has affected the run game since it doesn't pull defenders away from the line of scrimmage. Should the Jets be worried about their QB Aaron Rodgers-led offense? This was a performance out of 2023, which is the unkindest thing you could say about the Jets' offense. This was a complete mess, from Rodgers, 24 of 42, 225 yards, to the offensive line, 5 sacks, to the lack of discipline, 10 penalties. It was only the fifth time in Rodgers' career that his offense failed to generate a touchdown, including the playoffs. They faced a formidable defense in rainy conditions, but the Jets failed to mount any consistent threat. They made no adjustments and were a step behind all day. Rodgers was also limping late with a possible left leg injury, though he finished the game. After the game, Rodgers acknowledged that both legs were banged up, though he said he'd be fine. Biggest hole in the game plan, wide receiver Garrett Wilson's lack of involvement was alarming. Continuing a recent trend, Wilson was targeted eight times, five catches for 41 yards. He was covered by Pat Certain too on most plays, but offensive coordinator Nathaniel Hackett needs to find creative ways to get the ball into his hands on the perimeter. Running back Brees Hall, too, was a non-factor four yards on 10 carries. The Jets can't function when their two stars aren't producing. By the fourth quarter, Hall was on the bench in favor of rookie Brylon Allen, 43 yards on eight carries. Eye-popping stat, Knicks's minus seven passing yards at halftime were the fewest by a QB in a first half with multiple completions since 1978, according to Elias Sports Bureau. Still, the Jets didn't find the end zone once in the opening two quarters. They scored two field goals. How much does coach Kevin O'Connell trust QB Sam Darnold? The short answer, a lot. The Vikings had gone six consecutive possessions without scoring when the Packers made it a one-score game early in the fourth quarter at 28-22. Darnold had fumbled on a sack on his previous play, but O'Connell called six passes on the Vikings' next seven plays. Those plays included passes of 17 and 27 yards to receiver Justin Jefferson and got the Vikings in position for a 33-yard field goal. With tailback Aaron Jones available and pushing toward a 100-yard day, O'Connell's commitment to Darnold was aggressive, confident, risky and ultimately successful. 
describe the game in two words, sunny day. A beautiful, sunsplash day at Lambeau Field played a big role in the Packers' first score of the game. Just before halftime, Vikings punt returner Jalen Naylor playing in place of the injured Brandon Powell lost the ball in the sun and muffed it. The Packers recovered at the Vikings' three-yard line and scored two plays later, making it 28-7. Most surprising performance, cornerback Byron Murphy Jr. The Packers picked on Murphy often during their comeback, but he responded by forcing turnovers on consecutive fourth-quarter possessions to halt the Packers' progress. That included an interception in the end zone with 6.13 remaining and a forced fumble at the 4.18 mark. Did QB Jordan Love's knee injury impact his accuracy? It was nearly a triumphant return for Love after missing two games because of his sprained left MCL, and it might have been a victorious one if not for a slow start that included some uncharacteristically inaccurate throws. His ball placement was low or late at times. It didn't help that the Packers had a Tucker Craft fumble, struggled with pass protection and finished with five drops. Three drops were by Dontavian Wicks, including a potential 32-yard TD in the third quarter, and one each by Jaden Reed and Romeo Du. While Love threw four touchdown passes, he posted his second career three-interception game. Describe the game in two words, coverage issues. The Packers didn't have their best cornerback, Jer Alexander, and struggled in coverage without him. Justin Jefferson drew a pass interference penalty against Eric Stokes and caught a touchdown on Kayshawn Nixon. When the Packers pulled to within 28-22 in the fourth quarter, Jefferson was wide open for a 27-yard catch and run that led to a field goal with 6.50 to play. The only plus side for the Packers' secondary was safety Xavier McKinney's fourth interception this season. Early prediction for next week, the Packers will have a new kicker. Rookie Braden Narvison, who missed two field goals in the first three games, missed two more in the first half against the Vikings. He hit the right upright from 37 yards on the opening drive and then missed wide right from 49 yards midway through the second quarter. The Packers claimed Narvison off waivers from the Titans after a training camp battle between Greg Joseph and Anders Carlson didn't identify a clear winner. Joseph is now with the Giants, while Carlson remains unsigned. Can the offense maintain this consistency without QB Anthony Richardson? It's unclear whether Richardson's injury is serious, but if he misses any time in the lineup, the Colts got some reassurance of what they can do in his absence. Backup Joe Flacco was steady throughout. He completed 16 of 26 attempts for 168 yards, delivering a mix of quick, short throws with the more aggressive ones he has embraced throughout his long career. But Flacco didn't do it alone. The offensive line, despite starting rookie backup center Tanner Bordellini, was dominant at times, W.R. Michael Pittman Jr. had his best day of the season and R.B. Jonathan Taylor ran hard, per usual. Most surprising performance, Pittman had been off to a shockingly slow start to this season on the heels of his three-year, $70 million extension. Pittman had produced 36, 21 and 31 receiving yards in his first three games. On Sunday, he exploded for 113 yards on six receptions. Pittman also notched his longest reception of the season in the process, a 32-yarder on the first offensive play of the afternoon. Describe the game in two words, needed win. The Colts travel to Jacksonville next week, a place they haven't won since 2014. But with Jacksonville now 0-4, and that game followed by contests against the Titans and Dolphins, the Colts have set themselves up to make a bit of a run. They can easily continue their momentum after a win that got them back to point five hundred. Did the Colts expose the game plan for how to thwart the Steelers' vaunted defense? It took just one play for the Colts to put the Steelers' defense on its heels. Quarterback Anthony Richardson launched a 32-yard pass to Michael Pittman Jr. on the first play of the game, jump-starting a three-minute scoring drive aided by big plays. Richardson lit the Steelers up with three completions for 71 yards before exiting with a hip injury. Flacco picked right up where Richardson left off, tossing a 25-yard completion to Josh Downs on third down in the final seconds of the third quarter. Three plays later, Flacco hit Drew Ogletree for a 15-yard touchdown on third and loan. Though Taylor got loose for a couple big runs, it was the explosive pass plays that did the Steelers' defense in concerning with WRCD Lamb next on the docket. Most surprising performance, QB Justin Fields. A week after putting together his best Steelers performance, the full Fields experience was on display Sunday. 
He had the lows of losing more than 20 yards on a play before fumbling, and the highs for a dime to W.R. George Pickens for a 37-yard game on third down. Fields had an impressive bounce back as he led three second-half scoring drives and pulled the Steelers within three late in the fourth. He scored rushing touchdowns on the first two drives. Eye-popping stat, entering Sunday's game, the Steelers' defense led the league by holding opponents to a 21.88% success rate on third-down conversions. The Colts, though, converted 8 of 15 for 53%, including two third-and-10 conversions on a late-game scoring drive to go up two touchdowns. It also marked the first second-half touchdown allowed by the Steelers this season. Can the offense fix its sloppy play? On paper, the Texans' offense was supposed to be explosive coming into 2024. But through four weeks, the offense is averaging 18 points per game because of self-inflicted wounds. Sunday afternoon was no different. Earlier in the week, coach D'Amico Ryan said the penalties were addressed, but the offense still had multiple penalties that wiped out first downs and caused offensive drives to stall. That's part of the reason why the offense scored seven points in the second half, which kept the Jaguars in it until the end. Describe the game in two words, close call. A win is a win, so the Texans shouldn't apologize for it. But they have to clean it up on both sides of the ball. The Jaguars were winless, and the Texans allowed them to be the better team in the second half. Every Houston win this year has been by less than a touchdown and that's not sustainable in the long term. Eye-popping stat, the Texans' defense had a season-low pressure rate of 25% coming into Week 4, they ranked first in the NFL at 46%. As a result, they allowed Trevor Lawrence to have multiple TD passes for the first time this season. What is wrong with the Jaguars' defense? The unit played much better than it did last week in a blowout loss in Buffalo, but it didn't have enough against the Texans with many injured key players. Though Nickelback Darnell Savage, quad, should return this week, the statuses of LB Devin Lloyd, knee, and DE Josh Heinz Allen, concussion, are uncertain. Corner Tyson Campbell, hamstring, and LB Foisade Aluokun, foot, are still on IR. It's a tough hand for defensive coordinator Ryan Nielsen to deal with as Jacksonville tries to save its season. Describe the game in two words, season over? Effectively, anyway. Only one team has come back from an 0-4 start to make the playoffs, 1992 San Diego Chargers, and now the Jaguars are four games behind the Texans, 3-1, in the AFC South. Owner Shed Khan said before the season the expectation was making the playoffs. So, will this loss cause him to re-evaluate the program? Most surprising performance, Trevor Lawrence missed some throws notably deep shots to Christian Kirk and Brian Thomas Jr. that could have been TDs but this was the best he's looked all season. He looked confident and poised, which he hasn't since the first half of the season opener. He didn't light it up 17 of 31 for 178 yards but his two TD passes equaled his total through the first three games. Does this win instill confidence in the Bengals' season outlook? Not necessarily. To be clear, it was a much-needed win for a team that could not afford to go 0-4. But the Bengals didn't salt the game away as early as they should have. Cincinnati's offense stalled out on a few drives in the second half. Carolina wasn't able to make the Bengals pay for misfiring, but Cincinnati should have been able to breathe a sigh of relief much earlier than it did against the Panthers. Most surprising performance, CB Cam Taylor Britt. His big week two performance against Kansas City feels like a lifetime ago. The third-year cornerback, who has played well, struggled on Sunday. He allowed five catches on six targets while the nearest defender, according to NFL Next Gen Stats. One of them was a 21-yard touchdown to wideout Deontay Johnson. Taylor Britt rotated in and out of the game. Eye-popping stat, RB Chase Brown and WR Jamar Chase outperformed their projections in a couple of key categories. Brown finished 24 rushing yards over expectation on his first 15 carries, according to NFL Next Gen Stats. Chase also had 57 receiving yards over expectation, with 48.5 of those coming on his 63-yard touchdown catch. Does Andy Dalton at QB give the Panthers the best chance to win? Yes. For the second straight game, Dalton's steadying force in pinpoint passing he finished 25-440 for 220 yards, two touchdowns and an interception had a huge impact. 
Had it not been for a drop in the end zone by Deontay Johnson on the first series, who knows how this one turns out? Dalton has brought the deep ball back, something the Panthers didn't have with Bryce Young. In addition, the running game has opened up everything. Biggest hole in the game plan, there was no answer for WRT Higgins when it mattered. Missed tackles aside, Carolina did a decent job on chase with J.C. Horn defending. Higgins was almost unstoppable against Michael Jackson in the first half. He had six catches and drew two pass interference penalties late in the half to set up a TD. Most surprising performance, rookie receiver Xavier Leggett. He stepped up big time with Adam Thielen, hamstring, on IR Leggett entered the game with six catches for 77 yards. He had five catches for 49 yards and a touchdown in the first half. He should only get better. Is it too early to be concerned about the Falcons' offense? QB Kirk Cousins and company pulled a rabbit out of a hat again, winning in the final minute just like in Week 2 against the Eagles. Young Hoku drilled a career-long 58-yard field goal with two seconds left. But worries remain. On Sunday, the Falcons got scores on defense and special teams. But for the first time since September 26, 2004, Atlanta won without scoring an offensive touchdown. Eye-popping stat, going into the fourth quarter, Cousins was pressured on 6 of 27 dropbacks, 22%. The quarterback had struggled when pressured this season and Atlanta had two starting offensive linemen, C. Drew Delman and R.T. Caleb McGarry, out with injuries. C. Ryan Newsel and R.T. Storm Norton came up big in relief. Most surprising performance, inside linebacker Troy Anderson, who missed most of last year due to injury, had an interception return for a touchdown, a tackle for a loss, a pass defended and the most tackles, 17. Anderson has played more than many expected due to Nate Landman, calf, being on injured reserve. He exited the game in the fourth quarter with a knee injury and was questionable to return. Can the Saints find their week one offensive groove again? The Saints have had to adjust the past two weeks without important players on offense, and it was clear how much Taysom Hill was needed after he scored two touchdowns in the first quarter and left with an injury. Their offensive output also dropped sharply when he wasn't in the lineup last week. New Orleans will have to figure out how to adjust with a patchwork offensive line if it wants to return to the heights of the first two weeks. Describe the game in two words, injuries abound. The Saints came into this game shorthanded with two offensive linemen and starting linebacker Demario Davis out. Alvin Kamara, Chris Olavi and Hill were also dealing with injuries. Things only got worse during the game when Hill went out with an abdomen injury, he was previously listed as having a chest injury, linebacker Willie Gay was ruled out and Tyron Matthew had a groin injury. Most surprising performance, Kamara's performance despite injury. Kamara came in the game with a hip-slash-rib issue and took several shots to his ribs throughout the game. Kamara scored the go-ahead touchdown, had a key blitz pickup toward the end of the game, rushed for 77 yards and caught seven passes for 42 yards. What changed for the Bucks after last week's collapse against the Broncos? QB Baker Mayfield and the Bucks scored three touchdowns in the first 16 minutes and four total in the game. They exploited Eagles defensive coordinator Vic Fangio's soft coverage with a ton of quick hitters, protecting the vulnerable right side of an offensive line still without right tackle Luke Godick, concussion. Defensively, their meager pass rush saw six sacks after just two in the first three games and their secondary looked more sure-footed. Describe the game in two words, David dominated. Levante David contributed eight total tackles, including two sacks, two tackles for a loss, a forced fumble, a pass breakup and a quarterback hit in one of his finest games in recent memory. Early prediction for next week, the Bucks have entered arguably their most difficult stretch of the season, with three divisional games in a span of four weeks, plus games against the Ravens, Chiefs, and 49ers, with three of those games played in prime time. That includes the Falcons on the road Thursday night in Week 5, a game that, based on the Falcon Saints finish and Liam Cohen and Raheem Morris history working together, will result in an overtime finish. What should we make of the Eagles heading into their Week 5 bye? They're an average, mistake-prone team right now. True, they were operating without O.T. Lane Johnson, concussion, W.R.A.J. Brown, hamstring, and W.R. Devonta Smith, concussion, against Tampa Bay, but that doesn't excuse them sleepwalking through the first quarter, when they were outgained 186-0.
It doesn't absolve a defense that gave up nearly 30 first downs and well over 400 yards to the Bucks. And it doesn't wash away the fact that they have lost the turnover battle in every game so far. The coaching has left something to be desired, as the talented roster has struggled to put it all together. It will be a long couple of weeks in Philly before the Eagles host the Browns on October 13. Promising slash troubling trend, Jalen Hurts has 27 turnovers since start of last season, the most in the NFL, for more than anyone else. Seven of those have come this season, which ranks second in the NFL behind only Titans quarterback Will Levis. Hurts had a crusher of a giveaway late in the third quarter at the Tampa Bay 19-yard line. He initially evaded pressure from LB Levante David on first and 10 but was stripped from behind by David as Hertz tried to take a shot into the end zone. As has been the case with many of his turnovers, it was an example of trying to do too much. Biggest hole in the game plan, RB Saquon Barkley had just two rushes on the Eagles' first three possessions as the team fell behind 24-0. On a day when Philadelphia was missing its top two receivers and its standout tackle in Johnson, a Barkley heavy, all control game plan would have served the team well. The coaching staff waited too long to get him going. What improvements can the Bears' offense build on? Rookie quarterback Caleb Williams had completed just 44% of his passes against the Blitz through the first three weeks, but he was 8 of 9 for 75 yards with a touchdown against the Rams' Blitz. The Bears also figured out how to attack a goal line opportunity after failing a week earlier against the Colts. Roscon Johnson scored from a yard out for the game's first TD. Most surprising performance, DeAndre Swift was averaging 1.8 yards per carry and had 114 yards of offense through the first three weeks of the season. The Bears vowed to keep featuring the Pro Bowl running back, who broke through as Chicago's leading rusher, 93 yards, and receiver, 72, against the Rams. His 36-yard rushing touchdown in the fourth quarter was the Bears' longest since Valus Jones Jr. ran in a 42-yard touchdown in Week 18 of 2022. Describe the game in two words, defensive stops. Chicago's first touchdown came after the defense gifted the offense a 16-yard field after sacking Rams quarterback Matthew Stafford and recovering the fumble. The Bears sealed the game when safety Jaquan Brisker intercepted Stafford late in the fourth quarter. Can running back Karen Williams keep the Rams afloat until wide receivers Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua return? A week after a comeback victory over the San Francisco 49ers, the Rams' offense struggled for most of the game. Their lone touchdown came on a three-yard run by Williams early in the fourth quarter. It was Williams' seventh straight game with a rushing touchdown, which breaks a tie for the second-longest streak by a Rams player since the 1970 NFL-AFL merger. Williams ran for 94 yards and a touchdown on 19 attempts. Nakua will miss at least one more game on injured reserve with a knee injury. There is a chance Cup could be back for Week 5 against the Green Bay Packers, but Coach Sean McVay has been clear the Rams won't rush the receiver back. Biggest hole in the game plan, red zone conversions. The Rams only scored one touchdown on four trips to the red zone. They didn't move the ball consistently and struggled on third down, converting just 5 of 11 attempts, 45%. Eye-popping stat, rookie kicker Joshua Carty's missed field goal in the second quarter was the first miss of his NFL career, but the 12th missed field goal for a Rams kicker since the start of last season. According to ESPN Research, that's the most in the NFL during that time period. Carty did make his four other field goal attempts, just how big was this win against the Giants? Imagine what a loss would have been like. Three straight losses, and it would have been Armageddon. Folks would be wondering when the Cowboys would win again, with a schedule that features the Steelers, Lions and 49ers in the next month. The Cowboys can take some solace in their run defense, even if the Giants don't have an Alvin Kamara or Derrick Henry in their backfield. In addition, WRCD Lamb rebounded from a poor performance against the Ravens in Week 3. Most surprising performance, cornerback Amani Orowari was elevated from the practice squad Thursday afternoon, and he dressed because rookie Kalen Carson was out with a shoulder injury. Orowari was then called on in the second half after Andrew Booth struggled, and he ended the game with an interception on a Hail Mary. Carson's injury might not be long-term, and Darren Bland, foot, has had his eyes on a potential return against the Steelers, but Orowari helped settle down the secondary. Eye-popping stat, quarterback Dak Prescott completed 22 of 27 passes, marking the 12th time he has completed at least 80% of his attempts in a game, 
which is the most by any player since 2016. Prescott was dialed in throwing outside the numbers, completing 10 of 12 throws for 117 yards and a touchdown, according to ESPN Research. Inside the numbers, he was 12 of 14 for 104 yards and a touchdown. He averaged 5.4 air yards per attempt, his lowest mark in a game since week three of last season, after averaging 8.8 in the first three games. Have the Giants closed the gap between themselves and the top of the NFC East? They've definitely closed the gap on the Cowboys, as evidenced by what unfolded Thursday night. The Giants got outscored 89-17 in their two meetings with Dallas last season, but they had a chance to win in the first meeting this time. Again, the result stinks, Coach Brian Dable said, but I thought there was improvement. Early prediction for next week, rookie wide receiver Malik Neighbors is back for Week 5 in Seattle. He left Thursday's contest late in the fourth quarter with a concussion. But Neighbors was in the Giants' facility on Friday and in good spirits, according to Dable. The 10 days in between games gives him a better chance to clear the concussion protocol and not miss a game. Troubling trend, the Giants averaged 1.1 yards per carry against a Cowboys team that came into the contest with the worst run defense in the NFL. Running back Devin Singletary had 14 carries for 27 yards. Quarterback Daniel Jones did nothing on the ground. This wasn't the blueprint for success against the Cowboys. Not even close. That will need to improve if the Giants are to get a win against the Cowboys or Eagles this season. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to a new segment that we like to do on the show, T. Of course, part with SNN Sports, uh, I'm first of all, I'm glad to be back in front of the camera for you guys and to give you guys the greatness in the terms of sports. Now, I've been dabbling a lot in sports this season, and I got to say that so far, T, so far, I've been really impressed with this season. This season for NFL in particular has been one of the most uh, impactful seasons that I've seen and most interesting seasons that I've seen. Quite a few things that we see in sports today for NFL. And as we continue on with, I believe, is week five now, T, um, very, very impressive outlook when it came to the New York Jets. I was very, very impressed. Now, we all know about the New York Jets uh, last season where Aaron Rodgers stepped on Phil. He began his reign for being a New York Jet. And, of course, he got injured, right? That was last season. We're going to kind of forget about the last season. We're going to we're, we're gonna forget about the whole last season with Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets for last season, him being out and being hurt. But I am, I don't know, I'm very impressed with him in this season. Uh, I've watched the latest games of, of him uh, going against uh, quite a few teams. And he's, I've been so impressed, right? And it just kind of shows, in my opinion, it shows the level of, just the optimal good level of a veteran football player, but a very good quarterback. Um, a lot of uh, passage that it's, you know, when he's throwing the ball, it's, it's a complete pass and it's scoring. And I've just been so impressed with the New York Jets. I think, I honestly, I got to say here on the broadcast, I think I am going to be um, now a New York Jets guy, right? Because New York Jets, any type of New York team, T, I root for. I do. I root for the New York teams. New York, New York Giants, I don't know. They've been disappointing me this season. Um, they, I don't know, they just haven't been performing well. Uh, the games haven't been going well. The quarterback, Daniel Jones, have been doing well. It, I don't I don't see the New York Giants being a best team this season. I, I think this is going to be the season where they, they have a downfall. 
I really do. But seeing the New York Jets doing their thing with Aaron Rodgers, and I can, I, and, and we don't know, T, but we, we've seen the videos, we've seen the training, we've seen the documentaries of him getting prepared for this season, and I honestly think that he, he has something going when it comes down to the defense and offense within the New York Giants, of course. I'm very, very happy with that scoring when it came down to the New York Giants. I've been very, 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 very impressed with the um, with Atlanta Falcons. Now, obviously, we're based here in Atlanta. I've been very, very impressed with the Atlanta Falcons as I get my, my um, notes here for the Atlanta Falcons, of course. Now, the Saints came in town, and, of course, that score – was 26-24. I saw the game. I saw the match. It was a close game. It was, right? when I, And I said this in podcast before, T. I say this again. I get very nervous when the Atlanta Falcons play because when they play, they score, and we we got hope. And then the other team scores. We, we kind of like, okay, here, here's their choke moment, right? They didn't choke in this game. Right now, I was very excited to see because, you know, they're going against the Saints and obviously the Saints is our our top rival when it comes to our top rival team. Uh, But to see that 26, 24 score close match, it was right there in Mercedes Benz. Shout out to my big brother. He went to the game and I saw it on his social media that he was so ecstatic. He was so incredibly happy to see the the Falcons win, and I'm always rooting for uh, all of that. Kirk Cousins, again, I said this in the last previous podcast, Kirk Cousins has something going on to where he's he's making the Falcons shine. Now, they're number two in the NFC South Conference. Very, 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 very exciting. I, and I said this in plenty other broadcasting, I really do want Falcons to come on, on top. I want them to be successful. I want them to just be the team that we know that they can be. And I think they can do it. I think that they can really get it done when it comes down to it. Uh, The finale has been very, very good. Now, there's video. We'll click the video here um, because I, I don't know, I get very, very excited for that. Now, we're we're watching the video. Mercedes-Benz, of course, uh, top of the first 13 minutes in, 0-0. They're playing very, very harshly within that. Let me see if we can get some volume here. There we go. We're going to have volume in this. Robinson again. And they, it, I, you can tell that they're really pushing it. They're really working out their, their, their stride there. Lost it. I saw that, Matt. I saw that part, too. It was a touchdown. Because Rasheed fum- kind of fumbled the ball onto the end zone, and then they caught it or – caught it back and then landed it into now 7-0 and Derek Carr is pretty good too hey, uh, the quarterback for Saints pretty good too man yes and you can say you could really tell it that they really they really they're they're having their stride. They're really fighting for this one. Cause like I said with the Falcons, there's so much. There's so much. So much money is behind the Falcons. Mm. Oh, got him. So you can really see that the Falcons, they, they, they're fighting hard this season. And I, I, I love everything. Now, the thing is, as we get into the season, I hope that they, they have this hustle that I'm seeing with the, uh, with, the, with the Saints, right? I'm seeing the hustle with offense and defense. I see that they're having the stride. They're really working hard for that. Not for their, their money and their bank, but... Coach Raheem Morris, he has a lot of expectation when it comes down to this Falcons team, T. And it gets me excited. It gets a lot of us Atlanta people excited simply because we are very, very endowed into it. 
Dirty Birds. Then they, uh, Jason Hill hits the end zone, gets the touchdown. Man, I'm excited. Like I say, it's amazing, y'all. Falcons, they look, I tell you, Falcons has something. I got to say that Falcons has a, a good stride and they have a good idea of what they're trying to do. And I, I'm rooting for the Dirty Birds. I am because we were here in Atlanta, obviously, but I am rooting for the team because I want them to be a good team. I really do. I want them to be very, very good when it comes down to it. And speaking while we're talking at the um, Atlanta type sports, Atlanta Braves won the, their game against I want to say, uh, who did they go against, T, yesterday, 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 yesterday? We're going to look that up real quick because I want to see, okay, the Mets. I knew I knew that. It was the Mets. They went in. It was 3-0. to zero. And the Atlanta Braves has an idea, too, because this is the idea to where it's very, very impactful for them simply because this is World Series season. Right, we're getting close to that stride of the World Series, so I want the Braves to have that 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 repeat of 2021, and I think they can do it because they had some wins this season, they had some losses this season. It's been kind of hard for them to kind of um, get those get those runs in and and to really get the home runs in and to really strive for the team. But maybe, maybe they have an idea. Maybe they could really do really well. So we'll see what they do against the Padres today, the wild card match. Uh, Very, very exciting to see what they do. The third in the National League East, so that's pretty good. You know, we'll we'll see what they they do, what they manage to get out of it when it comes down to the Braves. So go Braves. Always rooting for the Braves. Now, the Braves is my favorite team because my grandma. (laughs) So speaking of sports and in Atlanta, I'm so excited to talk about this next thing on the SNN Sports Network uh, presented and powered by KLP Entertainment and the KLP Network. Um, this Saturday, now on to our uh, our other part of the show here for SNN Sports, we're dabbling back into talking more with the WWE. Now, you guys know WWE is my childhood. I really do enjoy WWE. I can't wait until they come to Netflix with, with Raw, right? Because when Raw comes to Netflix, it makes it easy for me to see. Um, we don't have cable at the house, at my house. A lot of people don't. So I kind of miss the shows because we don't have cable. We always stream things, whether it's a pay-per-view and when they're getting when Raw's getting ready to come to Netflix, y'all, it's gonna be there. Now, WWE this weekend, by the time you're hearing the show, this weekend, this Saturday, is gonna be WWE Bad Blood at State Farm Arena. This Saturday, October 5th, the show will start around 6 o'clock. Of course, I will be in the building to not only enjoy myself and to really watch the event and have a great time, but obviously we're going to that show so we can kind of watch it and then do our own little spiel here on the SNN Sports Network. Um, Very, very excited for that. Um, My childhood, we've watched wrestling, WWE with superstars for years, and we still watch it, right? Um, I'm very excited because we, we've we been to an event like this before, T. We went to SmackDown when they came to State Farm back, I want to say back in January. I think they came back in January. We went to SmackDown. It was me and my brothers. We had a great, great rocking good time. Loved it. So we're very excited for this because this is what we call, they call a PLE. It's a premium live event. It's a pay-per-view event to where it's a premium. You're going to see all the stops, all the action. It's going to be a big show, right? Very, very excited for that because, you know, you get to see Drew McIntyre versus CM Punk. I'm rooting for CM Punk in that regard. It's going to be a Hell in a Cell match. Very, very excited for that. You have Bailey versus Nia Jax for the women's title. Not really a big fan of Nia Jax. I, I just haven't seen the great strides of her, but who knows, right? Things could change. Um, who else? You have Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns are teaming up with uh, Solo Sokoa and Jace Fatu with a tag team match as well. Very, very excited for that. 
And it's just going to be a whopping great good of surprises, I want to say. There's a lot of great surprises going into the 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 the, the style of the, the, the card there. There's going to be a lot of things going to happen within there. I'm sure we're going to see some surprises. I would not be surprised if we didn't see, like, returns or not. Um, but it's going to be quite interesting to see what kind of surprises we have going on. I'm excited to see what kind of celebrities... Um, are going to be on the uh that's going to be the uh, celebrities that's going to be there at the um at the pay-per-view right because we're here in atlanta when we saw when we and in of course little scrappy may not know us but when we went to smackdown we saw we sat next to little scrappy and he was he was with his son right and then you know we looked and my my big brother he sat right next to him and they looked excited like we were best friends and whatnot it was a great, great, great conversation. So I'm surprised. Oh, Killer Mike was there too. Killer Mike was there too. Um, they did a little cameo there. He was promoting his album Michael, and he was going for uh, the Grammys, right? And of course, he won three Grammys out of that. You have uh, Liv Morgan versus Rhea Ripley for the Women's World Championship. Um, very, very excited for that. My vote for that is uh, Rhea Ripley. I love her style. She's amazing. She's crazy good good superstar and good with her techniques and good with her moves you've got uh damian priest versus uh finn balor uh with the breakup of the judgment day so you'll have that we're going to get ready to see that as well we have gunther versus uh zami sane again for the uh for the uh heavyweight championship title match very very exciting for that um looking at the card here i feel like we're missing one here we're missing missing some matches here on on the notes here because i feel like there's more there's going to be more going on let me get the uh, card official card from cbs sports let's see let's see who are we missing Okay, and yeah, that's it. That's uh, all we have on the main card for now, but I'm sure there's going to be some surprises. There's going to be some really good um, events. We like to go to these things because they're, they're they're very, very exciting to go to. And although, you know, I try to be, I, I would say we, I like to be an advocate for WWE. Why not? Um, when you go to an event like this, it's so impactful because when you go to an event, a WWE event live, it's not the same as going to it um, or watching it on TV, right? When you go to an actual event, it's the spectacle, right? You don't hear the commentary. You're watching it live. The superstars are performing their moves, and they're performing live. So that's always great to see. And when you see all of that live and the pyro and the whole production scale of an event, it's something it's something that you it's something that you get excited for. Right. We've been to SmackDown, we've been to Raw, um, we've been to back when Macon, Georgia. They came to the Macon Coliseum. They did live events there too. That was very spectacle to see that. We've been to WrestleMania, WrestleMania 27, when, when <laughs> shout out to the Georgia Dome, when we had the Georgia Dome before they blew it up. WrestleMania 27 was at the Georgia Dome, so we saw, went to WrestleMania. That was a spectacle in itself. So there's nothing like going to an actual event of this caliber, a PLE, and it's, it's something spectacle, right? I, I can't wait to see the... The, the outcome of this, and then we'll be back here on this and then the Sports Network to tell you, talk to you a little bit more about it. Um, but I'm very excited for this one. Um, this is going to be a, a, an event that you, if you if you haven't got tickets, if you're here in Atlanta and you're wanting to go to this event, I, I'm, I'm assuming they still got some tickets for sale. We got our tickets. We got some great seats. Um, I'm sure they still got tickets still for sale. I recommend you guys going to an event like this because – it's very, very fun to go to. I really, really enjoy it. Really, really enjoy it. So we're going to pass it up on here on the Sports Network. Andrew is going to give us the latest in NFL news. Take it away, Andrew. Audio Jungle. 
From the studios of KLP Entertainment, this is SNN Sports. 